While most women have healthy, straightforward pregnancies, some will experience significant complications. In this program, we will look at some of the more common difficulties these women face. We will begin with preterm labor. Labor is defined as preterm when it begins prior to 37 weeks gestation. This occurs in approximately 5 to 10 percent of all pregnancies and is associated with increased newborn morbidity and mortality. The etiology of preterm labor is not well understood, but there are several known risk factors, including maternal diabetes, hypertension, beta streptococcus, urinary tract infections, multiple gestation, previous preterm birth, uterine fibroids, uterine malformations, alcohol, tobacco, or other drug use, and fetal anomalies. Initial symptoms of preterm labor often include a feeling of pressure in the abdomen, sometimes described by the mother as being similar to menstrual cramps. She may also complain of lower back pain. The contractions usually increase in frequency, intensity, and duration over time. Occasionally, the woman will have no discomfort or sensation of labor, but will instead present with bulging amniotic membranes or a dilated cervix. Some women will interpret Braxton Hicks contractions as preterm labor. Braxton Hicks contractions are generally random and occur during the second half of pregnancy. Irregular and of lesser intensity and duration than actual labor, they are normal and not an indicator of impending preterm labor. They are often more noticeable during a first pregnancy. Preterm contractions may be slowed or stopped by improving maternal hydration through oral intake or IV fluids combined with resting in a lateral recumbent position. Persistent preterm labor may be treated with tocolytics, a class of drugs known to decrease uterine activity. Tocolytics include terbutaline, ritodrine, magnesium sulfate, calcium channel blockers such as nifedipine and verapamil, and antiprostaglandins such as endomethacin. The use of tocolytics is widespread but remains controversial, and ritodrine is the only one of these medications approved by the FDA specifically for the purpose of cessation of uterine contractions. There is little unanimity among physicians regarding the regimen, and the drugs are used both singly and in combination. One study of 6,000 patients showed magnesium sulfate to be used with the greatest frequency followed by the antiprostaglandins. IV terbutaline was also used with some frequency, while calcium channel blockers were the least common choice. Women undergoing tocolysis must be monitored closely. The commonly used drugs can have significant side effects, and the dosage required to control uterine contractions may be high. For example, terbutaline increases maternal heart rate, and if it goes above 120 beats per minute, the drug is withheld until the rate normalizes, or another medication may be used in its place. Magnesium sulfate can cause sudden drops in blood pressure, and neonates born following intrauterine exposure may be depressed and have lower APGAR scores. Severe maternal side effects include respiratory arrest and pulmonary edema, while the fetus may show a decrease in heart rate variability and oxygen reserves. 